God's Word this morning in the format of the Sabbath School class. Last week, we were introduced to the quarterly that we're going to be using this third quarter. We're studying the book of Galatians. Does everyone have a quarterly? Okay. And uh, we uh, learned how Jesus recruited Saul. This week we're going to be talking about him as Paul. And last week we were talking about him as Saul. The persecutor of the Christian church. And uh, we looked at, uh, welcome back. And we looked at Acts chapter 6. And how God used Stephen to do what? For the nation of Israel. To fulfill the promise of what? Daniel 9, 24 to 27. The beginning of the 2300 year prophecy, 457 BC. And the first part of that prophecy is what some people call the 17 or 490 year prophecy. And that was fulfilled when? 34 AD. So last week we studied how God went about one more time. Did he reject Israel after they crucified Jesus in 31 AD? No. He continued to try to appeal to them. But in 34 AD, when they decided to do something worse than crucify Jesus, they rejected the gospel. He said, okay, I will now go to the Gentiles And I'm going to pick the number one persecutor of the Christian church. Since I couldn't get the nation of Israel to proclaim the gospel, I'm going to pick the number one persecutor of the Christian church to proclaim the gospel. Mm. Amen. God has an interesting way of doing things, doesn't He? Mm -hmm. There's a lesson in all of this for us. So, this is the second week, and now we actually are introduced to the book of Galatians. And our main scripture is Galatians chapter 1. We're studying today, in chapter 1 of Galatians, Paul's credentials as an apostle, or as we would express it today, Jesus' ambassador. That's what the word apostle means. The very first five verses of Galatians chapter 1 have seven crucial words that once we understand them, they will provide the clearest revelation of Jesus Christ that I'm aware of in the entire Old or New Testament. Sufficient to save the world. If these seven words in these first five verses of Galatians were the only scriptures that we had in the Old or New Testament, an understanding of these seven words is sufficient to save you, if you understand them. So, let's begin our study by reading the first five verses in Galatians chapter 1. Do we have a volunteer this morning that is willing to read Galatians 1 through 5 for us? Chapter 1, Patty? Paul, an apostle, not from men nor to men, but through Jesus Christ, the Father, the Father, and the raised him from the dead. And all the brethren who are with me to the church of Galatea, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the present, the present evil age, according to the will of our Father, God, and Father, to whom we glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so the first word that we need to understand, and we actually sang it this morning, in hymn number 578. I said, wow. <laughs> This is providential. 
The word apostle means one that is sent, or he or she that is sent. The authority, credentials, and confidence of one that is sent is in direct proportion to the authority and power of the one who sends them. Let's establish this biblical fact by reading two verses. Both of, them in the, both of them are found in the book of John. Who would like to volunteer to read John chapter 3, verse 34? John chapter 3, verse 34. And another volunteer to read John, John chapter 5, verse 30. Okay, I have uh, Mary Jane. Okay, <clears throat> three, chapter 3, verse 34. Yes. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. Thank you. <coughs> what does that mean? That God does not give the Spirit by measure. In other words, God doesn't allocate just a little bit. He what? Overwhelms you with His Word. Okay, a volunteer for John 5, verse 30. Okay. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. There's that word, S-E-N-T, again. It is crucial that we understand what that word means. When an ambassador speaks on behalf of a king or an emperor, or in our case, a president, on whose behalf is that ambassador speaking? Is he coming and say, let me tell you why I'm here. No. I was a very successful this or successful that or I've made X amount of dollars in contribution to my party and I've earned my credentials to be named ambassador of the United States to your country. Is that what he says? Yeah. What, are, what are his credentials? The person that sent them. The person that sent them. And these are my credentials right here. This is the authority of the emperor, the king, or the president. With his signature, I'm representing, in our case, the United States of America. From a spiritual standpoint, what is Jesus saying in John 5.30? The Father is the one that has sent me. So he's completely removing any qualifications of himself. What's the object lesson there for me? If we are ambassadors of our Father, then it's not us. It's his credentials. And that is absolutely crucial. And one of the things that establishes our credentials is that, and then we're going to develop this a little bit more later, but your thoughts have to be disciplined to what? His thoughts. It's not your opinion. It's not your feelings. I lived the first 16 years of my life not in the United States. And I happened to, I couldn't drive at the time, I was too young. But uh, I happened to be a good athlete and there was this guy whose father was the ambassador of Bermuda to this country that I lived in. And he had this, and most of you are too young for this, this had this beautiful green packer, I don't even build it anymore, convertible. And he said, he said Hey, would you like for me to pick? Because after, after lunch, I mean, when you got through your classes by noon, you went home, ate, and came back and started school over again. So he would drive home and back. And he would pick me up. Boy, did I feel important <laughs> in that convertible green packer. <laughs> Unfortunately, he didn't act 
like an ambassador son to that. And he was proud about how many traffic violations he had accumulated and just turned them over to his father. And his father would just get him wiped off. And ambassadorial privilege. It's very important that we understand who we are. I saw two hands. Jim? When you represent God, you have to represent His character. Excellent. And that's the way we're going to conclude our Sabbath school. Represent His what? Character. We're representing His character. You had a I comment? Just had, I just had a thought when you were talking about His authority and our ours. Uh, a certain amount of, and I don't even know how it fits in, but there's a certain amount of humility there. <coughs> to not, to not, I guess, feel like you said you were feeling in this, in this pattern, you know. Well, man, this is really cool, but a certain amount of humility. Sure. I have a verse that goes along with this. It's Colossians chapter 3, 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Folks, we must never forget what the word apostle means. Now, last quarter we studied the book of First and Second Peter. So, in order to establish what we're talking about from Scripture, I would like someone to volunteer to read First Peter, chapter four, verse eleven. First Peter, chapter four, verse eleven. We always want to support everything we say when we're studying God's Word, right? Yes. Everyone, God gives everyone the right to their thoughts, their opinions. But when we're studying God's Word, we want to establish everything contextually and grammatically from Scripture. No opinions here. Volunteer for 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. Right over here. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, Thank you. So we speak the words of who? God. That means we have to have a reasonable acquaintance with God's Word. That doesn't mean you have to quit your job and go to college or the seminary. No, we're not talking about that. What we need to do is determine if we understand what the word apostleship means and that God is sending us individually on a mission, then if you can read, you need to go to here. And since this wasn't originally written in the English language, you need to get a dictionary, a Bible dictionary called a concordance, so that from time to time you can look up words and see what they mean. Okay? I know two languages. And I know for a fact that it's impossible to describe in another language certain words from another language. I'm looking at Linda right here, and I know she speaks two languages too. I think she speaks the same two languages that I do. So, what do we do? We go to the concordance to find out why the inspired writer chose a particular word to define the inspired thought that God gave that writer. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Even though Paul, last week Saul, consented to the stoning of Stephen on that famous road to Damascus in chapter 9 of Acts, verses 1 through 6, Jesus appears to him in a blinding light and he says to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, Who are you, Lord? Why does he say Lord? Because the word Lord describes not God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit. It, the Greek word is describing someone that is in charge. Someone that is in control. And at this point in time, Jesus is in control, although... Saul does not recognize him, but he knows that he's been blinded. This person is in control. This person is in charge. Do we understand that? Sure. Okay, and so what is Saul's response? Who are you, 
person in charge that's just stopped me cold in my tracks. Who are you? I dare you. I've got orders from the chief priests in Jerusalem to go and what? Ransack all these or at least check out all the synagogues in Damascus and locate these Jesus followers. And what does Jesus say? You're not persecuting the believers in Damascus. You're persecuting me. At this point in time, Saul is convicted. That's an important word. Conviction is something you're ready to die for. <clears throat> Preference is something, well, I prefer to do this right now, but oh, next week, well, I found out something else. I prefer to do that. No, a conviction is something you're ready to die for. Saul is convicted that the garbage that he learned from the religious leaders that Jesus' resurrection is a fabrication of the disciples of Jesus. Saul, his life runs across his mind right now. And he says what? To himself. Jesus is the Messiah. The one that our nation has been waiting for for 1,500 years. And we crucified him. And now he's speaking to me. That's quite a bit of information, isn't it? To go through a person's mind that's been blinded. But that's what happened. He was convicted of the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. The biblical meaning of the word reconciliation is restored to divine favor. Which is the condition that Adam and Eve were in when God created them. Remember Genesis 1, 26 and 27? God created Adam and Eve in His likeness and in His image. So, that is the experience of Adam and Eve before they sinned, until they chose to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent. Let's verify what I've just said by going to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. When you get there, say ready. And I will read. Two very, very important scriptures. Are we ready? Here we go. Romans chapter 5, verse 11. For if while we were enemies, what do enemies do to each other? They go to war and try to kill each other. Right? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. That's the first part of the verse. Did you say, excuse me, did you say 511? It's actually 510. I'm reading verse 10 first and then the other one. Romans 5, verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through his death, through the death of his son. What does that mean? Jesus ethically and legally reconciled the human race. By His birth, life, death, and resurrection. Amen. Did we have anything to do with that? No. Did God ask any member of the human race permission to do that? No. Not according to Scripture. God took the initiative by sending Jesus, knowing that He would be rejected and crucified. But we were what? Enemies. Jesus reconciled us to Himself. Now look at the second half of the verse. So that's what he did to the human race through his death. Much more, it gets better. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his what? Life. That is the active day-to-day -day relationship with Christ. He legally what? Reconciled me by his death. And if I'm reconciled, 
He will save me as I live my life because I'm focused on how He lived yes. His life. And I'm accessing that relationship every day. This verse 10 is loaded. Now, it gets better in verse 11. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the what? Reconciliation. Do you like that? This is what this is what the purpose of life was for the Godhead in heaven after Adam and Eve decided to disobey. Their purpose was to reconcile the human race back to themselves. I saw a hand. Did right. And what's that? What is that called throughout the Bible? That reconciliation. It's called a restoration of the covenant. That's why the Bible's real name is the Book of the Covenant. It's about a relationship <laughs> being restored. It's mentioned in the Bible hundreds of times. Okay. I encourage you strongly to look up the word reconciliation uh, in your dictionary. That's the Bible dictionary called a concordance. And already, if you have a strong analytical concordance, uh, I'll give you the numbers. It's 2643 and 2644. 2643 is the way that it's used in verse 10. 2644 is the way that it's used in verse 11. The word reconciliation means that we now stand before God as Adam and Eve did before they sinned. Amen. Amen. Do you like that? Amen. It's scriptural. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter how many bad choices we've made in life. God is really not concerned about what we do. What He's concerned about is why we do it. Our motives. He can take care of our verbs, you know, the sin. <laughs> if we will turn our condition over to Him. Great arrangement. All right, now what does it mean to be reconciled to God? Let's turn to the right to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to read three or four verses here. Continuing with identification of the word reconcile or reconciliation. When you're there, say ready. Ready. And we will begin with verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, what does the word therefore mean? It summarizes. something. He's going to summarize what he's been talking about. How about the next word? If. What does if mean? Conditional. Huh? Conditional. I have a decision to make here. Therefore, if any man, that's a generic term for cosmos, I mean, uh, human beings, anthropos. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has taken over. Why are you here this morning? There's only one reason for you to biblically be here this morning. Only one. To celebrate the creative power of God's Word. Amen. That's why God asked Adam and Eve, I just created you two. Now I want for you to celebrate with me everything that I've created for the six days preceding your creation. That's the only reason to be in church today. Sabbath observance is a celebration of the power of God's Word to create. We're talking grammar here, okay? Therefore, if any human being chooses to be in Christ by faith, he immediately is a new creature. Old has passed away. The new has taken over. Would that be considered a new birth? Yes. 
Yes. I have met Christians that say to me, they're very proud, they say to me, oh, I was saved, and then they give me a date. I went to this evangelistic meeting, or I, whatever, and I was saved. And I say, saved from what? <laughs> and, you know, they'll tell you, well, I used to do this, I used to do that, but I don't want to do it anymore. And I respectfully say, with all due respect, the human race was saved 2,000 years ago. You may have just found out about it on July 7th. But it became a reality for the human race 2,000 years ago. A.D. 31. But praise the Lord, you just learned about it today or yesterday. It's important that we understand that, folks. Because there's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. Amen. When I find out about it, yes, we can rejoice in that. But the actual saving of the human race took place 2,000 years ago. Verse 18. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Again, that doesn't mean you need to quit your job and become an evangelist or a pastor or whatever, a Bible worker. That means what? Once you understand that you have been reconciled and you say, yes, thank you, you now have become what? A minister of reconciliation. Is that a dramatic thing to see in a human being? Yeah. Someone that's acting like they've been reconciled. 19. Specifically, that God was in Christ reconciling the cosmos to himself. Not counting all the bad choices that you've made in the past. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. What? Does God's word, what does God's word have in it? The power to create. create, which is our reason for being here this morning. To celebrate God's power to create. By the way, do you believe that the Bible is inspired? Yes. At some point in time, we have to decide whether we're going to believe it or not. I believe it's thought inspired, not word inspired. Okay, the thought is inspired. Here we go again. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Amen. What is involved in becoming reconciled to God? Submission. Yes, thank you. Then all the other things that we should do, which the Holy Spirit will do in us, follows in its train. But there has to be a response of, yes, thank you. Or yes, or thank you. However you choose to respond. Now, what is the significance of all of this? Look at verse 21. He made him, who is the him here? Christ, who knew no sin, never sinned in thought, word, or act, to be sin on our behalf. How is that possible? What is that talking about? The incarnation. In order to ethically and legally save me, Jesus had to what? What does Hebrews 10 5 say? God put Jesus into a human body. Hebrews 10, 5. Why? As we will learn later on in Galatians 4, 4 and 5. When the fullness of the time had come, God, what? Sent His Son, born of a sinful woman, born under the condemnation of the law. Why? 
so that he could redeem those that were under the condemnation of the law. And what? Redeem us and make us sons and daughters of God. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. So he made